Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for today. We are going to get started here. Thanks. Welcome to today's webinar. Uh, it's Why Smart Money Trades Futures. We're happy to have our presenters here. We always try to give some different points of view and different aspects of the markets and give some uh, education and insight as much as possible. Uh, we just have a very quick compliance disclosure that we like to read off before we get started. So just bear with me here. Uh, please note this presentation is for informational purposes only. Nothing presented today should be construed as investment advice or recommendation to buy, sell, or hold any security or contract. Since we don't know everyone's investment objectives or risk tolerance, we're not endorsing any specific trading strategies. Security derivative of futures trading involves a substantial risk of loss is not suitable for all investors. Each investor must consider whether this is suitable investment since you may lose all or more than your initial investment. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Lightspeed is division of Line Brokerage LLC. Line Brokerage LLC is not affiliated with these third-party market commentators, educators, educators, or service providers. Data, information, and material, the content are provided for informational educational purposes only. This content neither is nor should be construed as an offer, a solicitation, or recommendation to buy or sell any securities or contracts. Any investment decisions made by the user through such content is solely based on the user's independent analysis, taking into consideration your financial circumstances, investment objectives, and risk tolerance. Please look at all the disclosures on the line brokerage and Lightspeed websites as well. Um, thank you for enduring that. Um, we're happy to have Dave Lerman, Director of Education, CME Group. In his role, Dave has traveled around the globe on behalf of CME Group, giving seminars and workshops to retail and institutional audiences, including pension funds, corporations, banks, brokers on risk management trading using equity index futures and options. Dave is also the author of Exchange Traded Funds and E-Mini Stock Index Futures. Prior to joining the CME in 1988, Dave was a member at the Chicago Board of Trade, where he traded futures and options on U.S. Treasury bonds. He was also Senior Portfolio Manager at Zavanelli Portfolio Research at Park Ridge, Illinois, investment management firm. Dave taught investment management at Harper College and has lectured at the Northwestern University, Kellogg Graduate School of Management, he received his BA degree in molecular biology from the University of Chicago. So people, please listen to what he has to say. He definitely has the experience and knowledge and will provide some valuable insight. We're very happy to have Dave here. Uh, just uh, quickly here, if anyone wants information on a demo or open an account with Lightspeed, please contact me. My name is Rob Lipson, uh, rlipson at linebrokerage.com, R-L-I-V-S-O-N at linebrokerage.com. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I'm going to shift the presentation of the mic over to Dave so we can get started. We're happy to have him here. So thank you very much. And uh, Dave, you should be able to share your screen uh, right now. Okay, is it up? Yes. Okay, we're good. All right, thank you, Rob. Um, on behalf of uh, myself and the CME group, I wanna thank Lightspeed for inviting us to do this presentation. Uh, I always kind of laugh when I see uh, someone reading my bio and you see the University of Chicago degree in molecular biology. Uh, yes, believe it or not, I used to isolate DNA from viruses. So what's gone on in the world in the last six months is very, uh, understandable to me and very interesting to me too, but uh, that's not our topic today. Somewhere along the road, I uh, dropped out of molecular biology and made it into the derivatives industry and have been working at the Merck for about 31 years now. So so today, I believe no matter what your level is, it's a basic level seminar, you know, why smart money trades futures, compelling reasons to open a futures account and consider trading it. And um, we'll get into this presentation. I We have just an audio and PowerPoint, so that'll make a, that'll minimize any potential technology issues or whatever, but um, we're going to talk about some basic things and then we'll graduate. And here's our disclaimer. All I have to do is read one sentence, but futures trading or swap trading, they're not suitable for all investors. They all involve the risk of loss. So do your homework. That's the most important thing we tell people at the CME as an educator, uh, do your homework. Uh, options and futures are not difficult. They just require you doing your homework. You can't go in with no knowledge. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about risk, and that's really what the building is about. The Merck was built for risk management, and we offer a wide range of benchmark futures and options uh, covering every asset class. So we have corn, currencies, crude oil, metals, which uh, unless you've been in a cave, uh, the metals are on fire the last week or two. Uh, silver making new highs, gold making new highs, or 
you know, movement highs. Uh, they're not at all time highs by any means, but they certainly broken out way above a trading range. We have interest rate futures, we have agricultural futures, we have weather futures too, to some extent. So the Merck is really built on risk management. And that's, there's one thing we can impart to traders, it's risk management. You have to get that right. Uh, if you don't get risk management right, uh, it's gonna be really difficult to, to become a successful trader. The ones that do become successful pay very strict attention to risk management. So um, the risk management landscape is very big. This may not seem relevant, but it does. Uh, the more you know and can learn about the background and risk and why you know the futures exchanges exist, uh, the better off you'll be, the better a trader you will be. But this is a chart that I put up um, usually in front of risk management groups, corporations, or pension funds, but it just shows uh, risk management being omnipresent. It's everywhere. So you look at some of the, you know, the, the entries there, Ontario Teachers Pension Fund is arguably one of the more sophisticated pension funds in the world. They use our products for their tech, tactical asset allocation programs. They use them for cash acquisition. They use them to hedge. They use S&P 500 futures and options. General Mills, obviously they make Cheerios and a whole bunch of cereal that we all enjoy. They use corn and wheat. Uh, so any raw material price increase is a risk for them and they use corn and wheat futures contracts. Uh, McDonald's, obviously they sell billions and billions of burgers every year. And uh, the price of cattle, live cow going up can have a substantial impact on their, their bottom line. So they might hedge using cattle futures. Uh, go on down now, uh, Starbucks, believe it or not, yes, coffee is a risk. Coffee moves up and down in price. But more importantly, uh, coffee also uses, uh, Starbucks also uses a lot of dairy. Uh, so they use our dairy futures contract to uh, mitigate their risk. And then down, uh, just we'll skip down here. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this slide, but you'd see Coca-Cola. I see question marks. Uh, you'll see question marks. Um, whoops. Well, Coca-Cola does business in 200 countries. They're based in Atlanta, Georgia. So what do you think that means? What's the risk? Well, currency risk. All those 200 currencies all have to be brought back to the United States and converted to U.S. dollars. So Coca-Cola has a nightmare when it comes to foreign currency translation risk. Uh, so they have an entire in-house team that hedges their, uh, their currency risks. And uh, you, can, you can imagine that they are uh, very, very adept at doing that kind of thing. So Citigroup, uh, the big large money center bank, uh, all areas, uh, they have risk in interest rates, they have risk in you know stock indexes, they have risk in currencies, the large money center bank, international money center bank. So they use all our futures and options contracts. So where do we come from? Before we go on, we have to say, where do we come from? We were primarily only an agricultural center, all right, from a regional agricultural center to becoming a global derivatives marketplace around the world. How do we do that? Uh, well, the business began in the 19th century, um, where uh, we did mostly agricultural products, all right, and that helped grow the city. You know, it, it, one part of the country would have a surplus of grain, and another area would have a shortage of grain. So someone got the idea, we can get together, get people together, and they can trade, and someone that has a surplus, if someone has a need, they can get together and exchange and trade. And the idea worked very, very well. You could see them, they have chalkboards, everybody's wearing a tie and a white shirt. Uh, the floors are largely gone now, but they're still there for a couple of products. Uh, and soon thereafter, the seat of Chicago became the center for commodity futures trading and options exchange. And we had three exchanges, the Board of Trade, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, and the Mid-America Commodity Exchange. So uh, that took us into the late 90s. Um, but before that, a very interesting thing happened, and then we'll start to accelerate our, our talk here. But uh, in 1972, uh, Leo Malamud, actually it was before 1972, Leo Malamud had an idea that if you could trade a futures contract based on cattle and pork bellies and things like that. Why not trade them on financial instruments like currencies or stock indexes or whatever? So he was 29 years old at the time, and he didn't think that uh, he'd get too much credibility from the board of directors. So what he did is um, he decided to enlist Milton Freeman, a Nobel Prize winning economist, to uh, write a white paper about the feasibility of doing financial futures on things like currencies. And given the Bretton Woods currency agreement was starting to unravel and it would lead to a lot of volatility in worldwide currency markets, Milton Freeman thought it would be a terrific idea. We paid him about, I think, 7,500 bucks. 
And it was probably the best $7,500 investment that CME has ever made because it turned into a multi-hundred million dollar industry in currency futures and options. So it's pretty interesting. And then uh, 1972, we launched the first contract. They were on currencies. They were on the major currencies. And they didn't trade very much, but boy, they do now. They do several hundred thousand a day just in the euro alone. Back then, they do you know a couple dozen a day when we first launched them. And then we went to the pits. Um, here's the pits. This is the S&P 500 pit. Uh, everything was open outcry, yelling and screaming, but it was very uh, organized chaos, as we say. Uh, but it didn't last for long because in 1997, we launched the E-mini S&P 500. We launched Globex in 1992. And now uh, everything is pretty much 95% of our volume is electronically transmitted and matched via our Globex computer-driven system. So you can see we have server banks all over uh, various parts of the suburbs and stuff like that. The pits are going away. They're still around. Uh, believe it or not, the most liquid options contract still trades in a pit. It's options on euro dollar futures. They still trade in a pit, although the pits are closed down till August 10th. Uh, they've been incredibly liquid. It's the most liquid options market by far. If you want to do a 100,000 lot trade, which is a very big trade, you can't. But uh, no one, very few people do that. So that's it for the history of how the Merck evolved to a you know open outcry system, right on the chalkboard to basically electronic trading. We still have some pit trading, although now the pits are closed until August when some of them will start to reopen because of COVID-19. All right, so let's get into it now. Why smart money trades futures at CME Group? Some of these are very simple. We'll get into them in detail, some of them, and some of them we'll just go off over pretty quickly. Uh, but real quick, execution costs, liquidity, capital efficiencies, around the clock trading, strategic reasons. There are pure direct play on markets and asset classes, and we'll explain all these things too. Supply and demand, smoke and mirrors absent. Uh, regulatory infrastructure is present though. So we'll talk about that with a couple of cases that uh, happened in the last 10 years, 20 years. The clearinghouse margin system forces risk management. So if you got bad risk management, futures are a great place to play to learn about risk management because your brokerage firm, um, Lightspeed, or your the clearinghouse, the Merck CME clearinghouse, uh, forces risk management via our margining system and variation margin and uh, margin calls and things like that. Also, active traders participate in the futures market, they, including very large pension plans, uh, foundations, big hedge funds. And if they're doing it, you know, it behooves first people to look into trading at the very least. They're, they're very good indicators to the futures markets. They sometimes will give you a heads up on certain things like overnight, the stock index futures are open while the U.S. stock market is not. It'll give you a really good idea what's happening in the markets overnight. So looking at futures can be sort of an indicator. And also, Tax considerations. We'll leave that for last because that's really important. That's one of the things that you know gets people to jump on one side of the fence and come to terms with futures and open a futures account because you're going to save a lot of money in taxes. They're taxed totally differently and more efficiently. All right, one execution cost. Futures are very liquid. They have very narrow bid offer spreads. Now, there's a lot of things that get into execution costs. You know but we're not going to talk about them other than the bid offer spread. That's the most important. If your bid offer spreads are really, really wide, you know, like Apple Computer, it was 355 bids, 420 offer. That's a pretty big bid offer spread. Uh, with futures, you have basically one tick markets. The minimum that they can move is the bid and the offer. And, and that's a big thing. If you're paying away very large bid offer spreads, it's going to eat away at your potential profit. So you want very narrow bid offer spreads. Usually you want one tick. The mini S&P 500, uh, usually crude oil, uh, gold, all those uh, usually one or two tick markets and most of the time a one tick market. So execution costs are very, very important uh, to traders. Oops. Second one, liquidity. Uh, believe it or not, um, some of the most actively traded products on CME that, that active traders trade are the E-mini S&P 500, the micro E-mini, which we launched last May, a little more than a year ago, crude oil, gold, and Euro FX. These are also some of the most liquid futures contracts that you can trade. The E-mini S&P 500 does one and a half to two million a day. The micro E-mini stock indexes do about a million to, you know, 700 to 100,000 to 900,000 every day. Crude oil does over a million a day. Gold does three to 500,000 contracts a day. And remember now, these are very large contracts. They're, they're bigger than 100 shares of a stock. Um, Euro does 
200, 300,000 contracts a day, and the dollar's been very, very weak lately. So there's been a lot of activity in there. So you have good liquidity, you have excellent liquidity in most of the top 20 or 30 futures contracts. And in the top five that most active retail traders trade, it's incredibly liquid. You'll have no problem getting in of one lot, five lot, 10 lot, which is a one contract, five contract, 10 contracts at a time. Very good liquidity. And again, you want to be able to get in and get it out really, really fast. You want to be able to do it, well, around the clock. So uh, we'll get to that later. The capital efficiencies is the third reason why, compelling reason why you should consider opening a futures account. Let's say you wanted to buy $150,000 worth of the S&P 500. Which of the following choices allows the better use of capital? Uh, an index mutual fund, the S&P Spiders, which we all know about, and, or the E-mini S&P 500. Well, if you look at the slide, to buy the uh, Spiders, um, 500 shares is what it would take to get $150,000 worth. Uh, the margin, uh, you'd have to put up 50% margin. So about $70,000, $75,000 of margin would be acquired. The E-mini S&P 500 would control about $150,000 worth of the S&P 500. They would track each other very closely. You'd only have to, you'd only have to put up about $6,000. So um, these margins are subject to change too. They can go up, they can go down. And the mini, the mini, uh, the mini S&P 500, or the micro even, excuse me, uh, would be a $15,000 notional amount. You'd have to put up $1,200. Now remember, margins change when things get more volatile. Margins go up. I think the margins are actually higher in the mini S&P 500. They're 12,000, and the micro e mini is 1,200. So there's a huge difference there in the amount of money that you have to put up, and capital is very precious. Uh, you want to be able to diversify a portfolio and have several futures contracts. And that's the nice thing about the micro e mini S&P 500 and the micro e mini indexes, is that they're very small notional amounts and very very small um, capital requirements. So small traders people that are new to their learning curve, people that are new to the industry can do it with far less risk than the pit traded S&P 500 or the E-minis, which are much, much larger in notional value. Ah, here it is, around the clock trading. So you want liquidity, you want narrow bid offer spread, you wanna be able to get in and get out. It's great to have liquidity in just the North American time zone, but what if you're a European trader or you're an Asian trader? What if you need liquidity in other time zones? Well, this is the great thing about stock index futures and most of our products, they trade 24 hours. As a matter of fact, they trade more in the Asian time zone or more in the European time zone than they do in the North American time zone. So this is good. Not all products are like that, but they have good liquidity in all three time zones. So if you're uh, based in the United States, and you needed to get in or out of a trade overnight, which happens sometimes, uh, you'll be able to do so. There's very good liquidity in the non-US time zone. And just to give you an idea of how good that liquidity is, a little case study here from the election in 2016. Uh, we all know what happened, uh, but what happened in the markets was really interesting. So Hillary Clinton had a five to 10 percentage point lead in the polls. She had the backing of an incumbent president, and she had, uh, was married to a former incumbent president. <clears throat> she had a billion dollar campaign chess fund to spend on advertising and ads. Uh, interesting, so not too many people gave Trump a chance. So just on the hunch that maybe an upset could be pulled and that Donald Trump would win this election, people were really, really scared the night of the election. Excuse me. And as a result, they sold off the Dow futures overnight, about 900 points, and the S&P 500 was down its limit at about 90 points. But an interesting thing happened. The very action, the very thing that they were scared of, a Trump win, a Trump victory, as it started to materialize, as the night went on, Trump was winning states he wasn't supposed to win. There were some battleground states that he actually won. And as a result, it became very real possibility that Donald Trump will win the election. And as a result, the very thing that everybody was scared of turned out to rally the market. As Trump started winning more and more states, Florida, Michigan, Minnesota, and uh, the market started to rally. So isn't that funny? Interesting. The interesting thing, though, is that you can see the volume. You see the price action. You can see the volume. There's a lot of trading. We did hundreds of thousands of contracts that night. Uh, we actually did more contracts at night than most futures contracts do during their primary trading hours. So uh, because Globex was open and futures were available to trade, people did, and they traded heavily. 
this this actually is, comes into not just election. This happens when there's a major announcement of something coming out of Europe or out of Asia. During the Brexit announcement, it was also very handy to be able to trade around the clock. And when the Swiss National Bank surprised everyone a few years back and depegged the Swiss franc from the euro, and the Swiss franc rallied 30% <laughs> in about 10 seconds. And boy, there were some very, very big gains and some very, very big losses. But the whole key point is you have good liquidity overnight, too. All right, fifth reason you trade futures, strategic reason, all right? There are things you can do with futures that you can't do with um, in the stock market or the ETF market, like spreads, intermarket spreads. We're not going to get into the detail here. I had a couple slides before, but we decided that would be a little too detailed. But you can, if you think large cap stocks like the S&P 500 are going to underperform small cap stocks, you can take that opinion in the futures market and go short the S&P 500 and long the Russell 2000 index. You can do that through futures. It's very easy to do. You could spread WTI crude oils at West Texas Intermediate with Brent. They're trading at a $3 price difference from each other. And they went as high as a $30 price difference many, many years ago. Uh, you could trade the yield curve. You can spread two-year notes versus 10-year notes. So you can't do this in the stock market. Uh, it's very hard to do. You can only do two-year versus 10-year note yield curve. You can only do it in futures. Um, you, intermarket spreads, July versus November soybean. You can only do this in futures. And many uh, good traders that have great success over the long run have spreads as part of their trading arsenal. So you want to do futures because there's strategies you can do that you can't do in the stock market or the ETF market. Sixth reason, there are pure direct participation or pure play on markets and asset classes. I always get phone calls, uh, you know, should I trade, you know, I want to trade the energy market. Should I trade ExxonMobil or should I trade Schlumberger? Should I trade, you know, Royal Dutch Petroleum or something like that? Well, if you want to trade the energy market, trade the energy market directly. Crude oil tracks the crude oil cash market uh, basically 99%. ExxonMobil and Schlumberger don't. ExxonMobil, there are times when crude oil goes down and it goes up and vice versa. Same thing with Schlumberger. ExxonMobil is a gigantic, large, integrated oil company. They have upstream, midstream, downstream operations. Uh, they have a chemical division. All these things, um, you know, impinge on it on a day-to-day -day or quarter-to-quarter -quarter basis. They may not move lock, step, and barrel with crude oil futures. And the same thing with metals. You could trade. You could trade the miners. You could trade silver miners, gold miners. You can trade ETFs. But the best and most efficient way to trade gold and silver, as uh, any gold and silver trader has found out the last two weeks, is gold and silver futures are very liquid. They turn in a 24-hour basis, and uh, there's tax advantages, and it's just a really, really good thing. And the volume in gold and silver, I mean, they just had a major breakout, not to all-time highs, but a major multi-year breakout. So that's something you really need to consider because there are people that uh, they play a market. You can make money, but why not play it the optimal way? Um, Regulatory infrastructure, why trade futures? Uh, first of all, CFTC, NFA, that's part of our regulatory infrastructure. We're regulated by the Commodity Futures Training Commission, the National Futures Association, the NFA. We have an in-house compliance and surveillance. These entities provide credible regulator markets. And that's why we have these very big derivative markets here in the United States at the CME Group, because we have compliance, we have surveillance, we're regulated and, and users trust, users find credibility in this kind of regulatory structure. Um, pure supply and demand. Our markets are pure supply and demand, basically. Um, smoke and mirrors are largely absent in a pure supply and demand environment. Corporate earnings can sometimes be manufactured and manipulated. If you look at Enron, remember Enron, or remember MCI WorldCom, um, they finagled their numbers and they eventually got caught. Uh, you can't do that. You can't mess with, uh, you know, $5 trillion a day market, the currency market. Very tough to manipulate it. The S&P is a $26 trillion market. Uh, no one can manipulate that. No one's big enough to do that. So that's a great thing about the future. They're very large underlying markets, and they're more honest than uh, the accounting at some stock firms, uh, some, some corporations. Very tough to manipulate the $5 trillion a day currency market. Like I said, ditto for the S&P 500. So having the regulation uh, gives us credible markets and it allows people to trade, you know, based on just pure supply and demand. 
So you can see CFTC, um, I'm not gonna get into all these things, but US futures industry has a long history of federal oversight, so that's a good thing. Okay, why trade futures? Reason number eight, clearinghouse margining system forces active risk management. Uh, like I said, um, they say that if you don't have good risk management, the futures markets can be a very, very interesting place for you to, you, you'll, you'll be forced to learn your risk management. I, I turn it around though and think, you know what, if you don't have good risk management skills, the futures markets will hone them and they will hone them very, very fast. Um, <laughs> so you have the clearinghouse. The clearinghouse, they're the ones that calculate initial performance bond margins, and they also calculate maintenance margins. Uh, they do the mark-to-market settlement every night for every futures contract, and they do the variation margins too. So let's say um, I trade with one of you, and we'll just call you Bob, okay? So Dave makes a trade with Bob. Let's say Dave makes 1,000, or Dave loses $1,000 trading E-mini S&P, and Bob makes 1,000. The clearinghouse will transfer $1,000 out of my account. They'll debit my account and credit Bob's account for $1,000. So the Merck is very important in terms of all the variation margin. Every day, that's going to change. Every day, you're either going to make or lose money, and that money will be debited or credited to the two accounts, the two counterparties accordingly. All right. They also set the margin. So the you know, Bitcoin margins are like 37% of the contract. The mini S&P 500 is about 7 or 8% of the contract. Why the difference? Bitcoin was very volatile. Bitcoin volatility was about 150% at one point. The S&P 500, despite how volatile it's been, not, didn't get anywhere near 150%. Even at the height of the pandemic, it got to 78%. It's now trading at about 30, 25, 30%. So with lower margins, there, or excuse me, with lower volatility, there's lower risk in the clearinghouse uh, assigns a lower margin because there's lower risk, less of a chance to lose money. Uh, the variation margins are just what's collected every night based on the settlement, and uh, the CME does this every night, and they can also do it intraday if there if need be. All right, they can change margins anytime they want. So anytime you see margins, remember subject to change. And maintenance margin. So if you put up an initial margin of six thousand dollars on a contract, there'll be what's called a maintenance level, and uh, it might be five thousand dollars. So if you get down to the $5,000 level, in other words, if you lost $1,000 in trading, you would have to bring your margin back up to the full $6,000 amount. Your clearing firm, your firm, FCM, Lightspeed would do this for you. But uh, you don't want to get in a situation where you get a margin call. So you had, people just generally leave enough money in their account that they wouldn't have to worry about a maintenance margin call. And they trade accordingly. And that's part of the risk management. You trade the correct position size. If you have you know, a $10,000 account, your firm is not going to let you trade 100 mini S&Ps. You don't have enough margin money, all right? So you have to make sure you get your position sizes correctly. There's a lot to learn. The learning curve is not difficult. In a couple months, you can have the basics down or even a couple of weeks have the basics down. But to become a good trader takes a longer time, probably years, to become a good trader. Uh, so... At the clearing process, they monitor all trades. They ensure the financial integrity of every trading party and the transactions in their respective markets. So that's a good thing. Just a little bit. We're not going to get into this, but these di diagrams are really complicated. But you can see clearing firm A, clearing firm B. You can see all the customers. It's a very, very in, um, intense structure that involves the settlement banks, the CME clearinghouse, uh, swap execution facilities, clearing firm banks, customer banks. And this is the dance that's done every day. Um, the money just goes from one account to another account, to a bank, to a customer bank, to a settlement bank. And the system works very, very well and has for almost 200 years. People think, you know, there's, there's businesses that have been in business for 20, 30 years. Well, the CME, the Board of Trade, have been in business for over 190 years. That's so almost two centuries. So we've gotten pretty good at clearing trades and mitigating risk. I mean, not perfect, but uh, good system. Um, there's a detailed uh, diagram of how a trade would work, clearing firm A, clearing firm B, and you, again, we can, you, um, Lightspeed, I believe, is going to archive this, or if anyone wants the slides, contact, um, contact Lightspeed, they can, they will have the ability to distribute this. I will give them permission to send these out. But you can just see the interaction with the clearinghouse and the various brokers and trades that go on. And I don't want to get into too much detail of this, but it's a very well-oiled system and it works pretty darn good and has for a long time. Uh, we're going to...
skip this one, but it just talks about credit controls. In other words, if you have 10,000 in your account, you tried to buy a hundred lot in uh, the mini S&P, the credit control people would screen you out, all right? If you try to put too large an order in, the maximum order quantity would fail. If you try to put it, you know, you wanted to be a rogue trader and trade 10,000 contracts, you could never do 10,000 contracts at one time. So anyways, we have all these things that allow for risk mitigation. And believe it or not, once your order is placed and it's executed, assuming it's a market order and you pass all the credit controls and everything, all this is done in less than a millisecond. So it's pretty amazing how uh, the system works. The Globex matching engine is very, very robust, very fast. Um, there's some latent, latency occasionally. Things slow down to maybe 100 milliseconds or 500 milliseconds if there's a lot of trading going on and a lot of volatility. But in general, 95% of the time, trades are done in a millisecond or less. Uh, more on the risk mitigation. Again, if you want to see what the CME Clearinghouse does to monitor risk, look at all those bullet points. They risk monitor 24 hours a day, six days a week, daily mark to market. I heard um, someone from the Clearinghouse give a talk once that talked about how they monitor the risk, and it's just incredible what they'll look at. They'll look at credit default swaps, they'll look at clearing member performance bonds, portfolio margin, collateral, risk policies, credit risk. Uh, they look at all these things basically 24 six uh, and that's why we're pretty good at what we do acceptable collateral again that's something you can look at on your own um, you're going to put cash down or treasury bills for the most part when you open an account with lightspeed or trade futures you'll probably just have cash in your account or treasury bills or something like that you won't do strips or mbs's or you know us you, you would do U.S. Treasuries or cash, and you can see there that that top line, the top tier of lines. But most people don't put corporate bonds on or foreign sovereign debt or ETFs and stuff like that. Other partners in the market, CME clearing relationships. Uh, you can see uh, we work with the uh, Options Claim Core and also the deposit, <laughs> tongue twisted, Depository Trust uh, Entity, DTCC. Uh, we work with Dubai, Dubai. Dubai Mercantile Exchange, the Aris Exchange. Also, we have mutual offset with the Singapore Exchange. We have clearing and settlement banks that we work with. They're very large entities. They're all household names. And then here's the CME clearing member, some of the CME clearing member firms, and you can see all the various firms. They're very, again, household names, very big names. This is all on our website, so you can uh, check it out. So back to our 10 reasons, 10 compelling reasons. All right, so why trade futures? Number nine, uh, many active traders participate in futures markets, including large money managers and pension funds. So if you look at some people with some of the best track records, Michael Starnhart, Julian Robertson, George Soros, the Harvard and Stanford Endowment and stuff like that, SAC Capital, they all trade futures. To some extent or enough, they all trade futures contracts. Um, and if they have amassed the great track records they have and futures have been part of that, it behooves traders, uh, new traders coming into the market to look at them. They're also, they can be great leading indicators for the cash market. Again, um, overnight, what the mini S&P futures does overnight, it's going to be a wonderful indication as to how the U.S. stock market's going to open up the cash market during the day. So you want to look at that. If U.S. treasuries or the currency sell off violently, you could be sure that other markets are probably going to follow too. If the crude oil market sells off violently or rallies dramatically, it's going to impinge on several certain sectors and the stock market. So if you trade the mini S&P or trade, you know, anything equity related, there's a lot of things that can help propel the market higher or drag it down. So you want to you want to at least study futures. Uh, they'll make you a better financial consumer, so to speak. They may not make you a great trader, but they'll make you a better trader if you look at futures contracts. But, you know, trading them offers several wonderful advantages that, of course, we've highlighted in this webinar. Tax consideration. See if I got this thing up here now. All right. So who makes more? Someone who has a ten thousand dollar profit from trading securities, or someone who makes ten thousand dollar profit trading futures contracts? All right. Futures trading falls under the Internal Revenue Code section twelve fifty six. That means they're taxed according to the sixty forty rule. Sixty percent of your gain is taxed at a lower long term capital gains rate. Forty percent of your gain is taxed at an ordinary income. So someone in the thirty two percent tax bracket, one of the higher tax brackets. Um, the blended rate would be around 28% for the highest tax bracket. Actually, the highest tax bracket, I think, near 40%. 
But if you're in a 28 or a 32% tax bracket, your uh, blended rate would be around 21%. So I paying 21% on a $10,000 profit versus paying 28%, um, that's substantial. That's $2,800 versus uh, $2,100. So it's going to save you $700 trading futures versus an ETF or a stock. This is on short-term gains too, things held less than a year. So it's something you want to consider. Um, and at this point, I usually ask someone, you know, they raise their hand, they go, oh, okay, is it worth the hassle just to save on taxes? I go, well, I just simply return the question and I say, are you a good trader? Because you're, you're a good trader and you can make decent profits consistently every week or every day. Um, those taxes are going to add up. Think of it. If you make $200,000 trading in a year or $100,000 and you're paying 28% versus 21.2%, um, it's going to be a substantial hit uh, to your income if the Internal Revenue Code, you know, it's, it's totally legal. This is not tax evasion, which is illegal and will land you in the slammer. It's um, tax avoidance, which is totally legal. Um, as long as you have an accountant, accountant's blessing, you know what I'm saying. Okay, so those are the 10 reasons. So just a real quick thing here. I have the contract spec here for the micro contracts. I'm not gonna go over all of them, but before you trade any futures contract, you um, you should you should understand the contract specs. You don't have to memorize them all, but you know, you probably focus on the mini S&P 500 and maybe the micro E-mini NASDAQ. Now MES and MNQ, those are the ticker symbols. You have the contract multiplier there, so it's just five dollars times the S and P 500. What it's trading at? So if it's trading at three thousand, uh, it's three thousand times five. That's fifteen thousand dollars. That's a notional amount of the contract. You only have to put up a small amount of that. So minimum price fluctuation is called the tick. Now in uh, stocks, they move in penny increments: 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.03. In futures, it's different. We have things called ticks. And with the micro E-mini S&P, we trade in quarter point increments, 0.25 index points, and that equals $1.25. So the S&P 500 goes up one full point, that's four quarters of a point, uh, and that would be um, $5. So we move from 3,000, 3,001, you make $5. So you can see you have to you have to we have a trading simulator too. The CME group has a trading simulator and you could trade the mini S P and the micro E mini S P and the micro E mini NASDAQ. You could trade many contracts and uh, you can set up a hundred thousand dollar account, it's fake money, but it's a great way to learn and understand how margins work. It calculates your um realized profit, unrealized profit, realized gains, it calculates your margins for you. Um and it's very, very realistic, much better than paper trading. So go to the CME group. Um, website cme.com slash education our education part of the website has um, the trading simulator it's very easy to get into you might have to register and put a little bit of information in there but in general the trading simulator works very well for someone that's brand new to trading or is just starting their learning curve knows a little bit but it'll help you calculate your profit and loss it'll help you understand ticks and uh, it's very realistic and it will chart the market real time or pretty much real time. So we're, uh, you can read those contract specs on your own. Uh, we don't have time in this webinar. We wanna leave time for questions. But um, just to show you contract notional values along across a sampling of products, you can see the standard S&P. This is the one that was launched in 1982. It used to trade in a pit and electronically. $750,000 contract. So if the S&P moves 1% a day, which it does frequently now, that's 7,500 bucks. That's a lot of money. The average futures accounts, you know, what, 20,000, 30,000. And you take a large amount of money out of the accounts on that size contract. That's why we came up in 1997 with the E-mini S&P 500. It's a $150,000 contract, one fifth the size of the standard S&P. And a 1% move would be $1,500. So a little bit more digestible there. And then we launched the micro E-mini and it's a $15,000 contract down there in the, uh, at, the, at the bottom there. Very, very, very small uh, contract size. Perfect for a new trader. If the S&P 500 went to zero, which it's never done and probably never will, and the most it's ever done now is like 77% in the depression. Um, if you lost 100%, of the notional value, it's $15,000. 
a lot better than $750,000. But again, the odds of the S&P 500 going to zero are never happened in the history of the United States. So I don't know if there's any stock market that's ever went to zero, but some of them have lost 50, 70, 80, 90% of their value. But anyways, uh, that just goes to show you the size of the various contracts. Gold futures is now up to $186,000 because it's been rallying like crazy. Uh, WTI is about a forty thousand dollar contract because it's rallied a little bit. It's a hundred, uh, it's a thousand barrels times about forty thousand, not forty dollars per barrel, so it's a forty thousand dollar contract. So you should be familiar with these things if you're going to trade futures. You'll probably start, you know, with a low notional value because it's it's lower risk and Lightspeed can guide you on that. CME can help out with education. We have a lot of good education material, and we'll get to that later. Um, we're not going to talk about this, but uh, this is an institutional way that people use. Uh, we're just going to skip over this stuff. Um, the way that one of the ways that um, institutions use our contracts, and uh, we don't need that for this seminar. Um, just so that you can gauge, um, uh, it's very interesting when I when I talk to people, uh, and I go to a lot of trade shows. I've been in the business three decades, so it's interesting when people hear about some of the returns and futures. You know, can I make 100%? Can I make 200%? Can I double my money every quarter? And it's like, what? Uh, it's not likely. <laughs> so I put up here, this is from a book, The Man Who Solved the Market, how Jim Simons launched the quant revolution. Uh, for a long time, Warren Buffett pretty much held the top, the mantle for the best, greatest investor of all time. But he still does in the eyes of many people. But this uh, little chart shows the returns of the very, very best. Jim Simons ran the Renaissance Fund, the Renaissance Medallion Fund. It's a hedge fund, major quant fund. The uh, MIT graduate expert in stochastic geometry, if you're interested in that kind of thing. And uh, always hired quants and physicists and computer scientists. And at first he didn't have success, but after he fine tuned his models, oh my, did he have success. Annualized return from 1988 to 2018, that's uh, 30 years. 39%. Actually, he made a lot more. He made 44%, but he had a 2% or a 4% annual, you know, management fee, and then he took uh, like 30% of profit. So he had very steep fees, but still provided 39% returns. That's how good he was. Um, and he traded a lot of futures. He traded everything. And when you have a computer doing things, it's amazing the amount of trades. Turns out, just barely 51% of its trades were profitable. But when you make a lot of trades and you have good risk management, 51% is a really good record. All right. George Soros, 32% from 69 to 2000. Stephen Cohen, 30%. Peter Lynch, who ran the Magellan Fund, got 29% for 13 years. The cool thing about Warren Buffett, you know, he only gets 20%, 21%. But he did it over basically 50 years, 40, 50 years. Um, it's one thing to get 39% over 20, 30 years. But boy, when you're doing this for 40 or 50 years, you compound money pretty well. And, you know, Jim Simon, multi, multi-billionaire. Warren Buffett, obviously, second or third richest man in the United States. So I put this up here. I just wanted to tell people that futures trading is, you know, it involves risk and it's not suitable for everyone. But I wanted to gauge people's expectations. If you think you can get, you know, 70% return on your money every year, uh, the very best in the world don't get anywhere near that. So I just want to gauge your expectations. I don't want to talk anyone out of anything. Futures markets are a wonderful, wonderful way to invest and trade. Um, but you got to do your homework. And uh, e even people that trade in the equity markets, I hear people, you know, with things like Tesla going up 300% in basically four months. Um, I just want people to not to realize that those kind of gains are the exception rather than the rule. All right. So we're almost out of time here. We're gonna we want to allow a few minutes for Q and A, but I just want to uh, remind everyone of the CME Institute. It's a great place to learn more about futures and options markets. It's uh, on the education part of the CME website. We have a lot of online classes. We have resources. We have trading the trading simulator, which I spoke of, and we have a bunch of other tools that will help you sharpen your skills. Lots of free material, and some of it's really good, and it'll deepen your knowledge. And like I said, it won't make you a great trader, but it will make you a better trader. At least it'll give you the basics. And we're here to help. The folks at Lightspeed, I'm certain, are there will uh, be willing to help out and um, provide more information as you need it. So that's it for my spoken part. And if uh, there's any questions, uh, feel free to start ask, uh, putting them in the dialogue box. Or Rob, if you want to just verbally ask, present them, I'll try to answer them.
Any questions? Polling for questions. Hi, someone did ask about uh, maybe going over some of the tax advantages, if you have just a couple points to compare. Yeah, I, I, I have a really good chart. I just didn't have it in this webinar, but um, I, it does, it's a comparison. It takes someone in the 32% tax bracket, breaks down exactly how much you'll pay as a, if you made that $10,000 gain in futures versus making it in ETFs or stocks. And on a $10,000 gain, one would pay $2,180 in taxes. The other one would pay $2,800 in taxes. So that's a $700 increase. It's the same gain. You both traders made $10,000, but you pay $700 less in taxes uh, doing it via futures because of the way the, the IRS taxes futures. Well, that's the only one, but it's a big one. So if you're in the upper tax brackets, it's even better. If you're in the 32 or 34% tax bracket, the savings would be even more. But uh, short-term gains on uh, ETFs and stocks are taxed at ordinary income. And that's always at your tax bracket. 60-40 will give you 60% favorable capital gains treatment and 40% ordinary income. So if you're a good trader, it's the place to be. Any other questions? Uh, someone asked about some continuing education for futures. I know you had some resources pointed out. Where would you just reiterate where people would, would go to check out some additional educational resources? Yeah, there's a lot of stuff on the internet that's good. Some of it's not so good, but you go start with the cmegroup.com slash education. There's a lot of, you know, we don't, we don't have any ax to grind, so we are just educational there, but there's a lot of seminars. There's a lot of webinars, a little, little videos, 10, 15, 20 minute videos or five minute videos. They're really good to help you get going. And then, you know, I always use YouTube when I want to learn things. Uh, some, some of the stuff's really good. Some of it's not so good. A lot of it's, it's Kind of cheesy people try to uh, sell you something and uh, I'd stay away from those and I'm sure the folks at Lightspeed have some things too that they can offer up but uh, between Lightspeed and the CME group and the internet there's a lot of great education out there great uh, someone also asked on the trading options on futures on the taxes is that the same type of tax yes application but confirm I am not a CPA. The Internal Revenue Code applies to 330 million Americans. There's only 10, 10 of 10 people in this country that truly understand the entire Internal Revenue Code. I am not one of them. <laughs> so you just check with your account. But yeah, the futures do, and I believe the options do also. Thank Double you. check with your account. Someone was asking the difference of futures commissions versus stock and option commissions. Obviously, that's a discussion with a broker. There's a lot yeah. of comparisons it really depends on activity and what you're trading and your strategy and risk so you know obviously you can give a straight answer of a dollar versus 60 cents but it really depends on a lot of factors on how many contracts or how often you are trading exactly and not only that that's what i talked about at the beginning when i talked about execution cost a bit offer spread you know you could you could trade you could have two people one can be you know paying you know, a $10 clearing fee, let's just say, which is ridiculous. And um, he would actually be, if, if the bid offer spread was only one tick, that's it, $10 would be his fee. But what if someone else trades for free, but the bid offer spread is, you know, six ticks? Who's going to pay more? So it's not, it's not commissions. Commissions are a very small, infinitesimal part of the overall transaction cost. It's your bid offer spread difference that's going to be the bulk of your transaction cost, which is why we tell people trade liquid markets because the bid offer spread is infinitely more impactful than whether you pay 60 cents or a dollar or whatever, uh, the clearing fee. Understood? Absolutely. Any other questions?
Well, Someone asked about the no simulator, the, the account that you asked, uh, is, does that provide for full live data or is it, is it a delayed type of environment? I believe it's mostly, it's, it, if it's delayed, it's by a minute or two and that's it. Um, so it's, it's pretty realistic. Um, it follows the market very, very closely. You know, in the old days, we used to be stuck paper trading. We'd write a trade down on a piece of paper and hope that it works out. With this simulator, it calculates your profit and loss and deducts it from your fake money account. So it's a very good way to learn. Anything else? One question came in about just a general question about how iceberg orders work and the dynamics. Do you have anything to comment on, on that or just really uh, more I'm kind leave of that for you. specific? I am not an expert. Yeah. Different orders. That's an iceberg order is, I believe, um, where you have an order into the market, but behind it, like you want to sell 50 contracts or buy 50 contracts, but behind that, you might want to buy 500 contracts. You don't want to let the market know, but I think the in most contracts, our contracts are so liquid that, you know, I don't know the function of some of those things, but in some other markets, you might want to hide your position. You don't want to put the full amount out, but I can't comment any further than that because I'm not an expert in the Globex order systems. Fair enough. That's how I would answer it as well. <laughs> yeah, the, the vast majority of trades, I mean, if you look at the average trade size in the mini S&P 500, it's like three to five contracts. You're not going to iceberg that. <laughs> it's, it's for large traders that want to do a lot of size and are afraid of moving the market. The problem is I always debate people, and I've debated this in front of many, many audiences, that especially like in euro dollars or treasury bonds, you can do any size you want. If you want to do 10,000 contracts in treasuries, it's still a one-tick market. Um, so. <laughs> and we have a look well, you know what we have a liquidity tool i should probably mention this we have a liquidity tool and you can go on this liquidity tool it, it's uh 17 or 18 of our most um actively traded contracts except for euro dollars they left euro dollars out and i think i know why because it's so liquid everybody knows it's so liquid that they didn't need to do it but you can press in like in s p 500 you can put in any date over the past year or two and you can do it North American time zone, Asian time zone, or European time zone. And it will tell you what the average bid offer spreads for a five lot, for a 10 lot, for a hundred lot, for a thousand lot. So that's the best way for you to gauge liquidity, I think, and how to put your orders in and stuff like that. You know, you could do a thousand lot in treasury bond futures. Easy, piece of cake. You want to try and do a thousand lot in lumber? It's going to change the price a lot. The bid offer spread and the depth of the order book is just not as great in lumber as it is in treasury bonds. All right. So the liquidity tool, it's called the CME liquidity tool. Just go to the CME group website and press in the search button, liquidity tool. And it's free. Anything else? Uh, any other questions, guys? Oh, good trading to everyone, and uh, make sure you do your homework if there's no more questions. Thank you. I believe that pretty much wraps it up. Uh, we thank you so much for taking the time. I, I hope everyone really got some uh, insight out of what David presented here it was uh, I certainly did it was really uh, informative and like I said this will be posted to our website within a few days so this will be available for viewing so certainly look for that to go over any points you may have missed and certainly email Lightspeed with any questions you have about testing out a futures platform or opening up a futures account and we happy to assist with with anything we possibly can here so guys, uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, David, for having uh, the time and presenting for us. We're, we're, we're very thankful and we hope to, to have you back. Ah, thanks, I'd, I'd love to. Um, and you're welcome. Uh, I always love working with firms. 
and traders and new traders. Uh, uh, always a pleasure to do that. Great. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a have a great night. Thank you.